What we have been learning is the critical information. Today we're talking about the prison, prism of antinomianism, more of Satan's slander on God. The root of it is to redefine the love of God and denigrate God's law. And basically it's like this, okay? I don't want to have to prove that I believe. I don't want it to where you can test my belief. I don't want anybody to be able to judge me or any accountability, no test of my faith. I want to disconnect faith from obedience. So basically, I can say to you, God looks on the heart and you can't judge me. And that's what they want. That's, that's why antinomians are antinomians, okay? They want to make the law the culprit and justify the wicked. They want to make the sinner the victim, not the villain who needs to repent. They want to make Jesus come to save us from God's law, implying that there are unjust demands simply because we can't do it. They want to make those who seek in, to obey God and live a holy life, they want to make them out to be Pharisees, trying to work for their salvation. You don't realize that if you were really spiritual, you wouldn't be trying so hard to be holy. You would just be appropriating the grace of God. Don't think your holy living is going to get you to heaven any more than the rest of us. All your righteousness are just filthy rags. Only Pharisees worry about being obedient and holy. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You're just frustrating the grace of God. I heard all that nonsense. Look at Ezekiel 13, 22 there. This is not new. This antinomian nonsense has been going on for a long time. It didn't come from the Gnostics. It, it was before the Gnostics. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hand of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. It's the same old stuff. Your salvation is not dependent upon your obedience. You say, did the Jews have something like that? Oh, yes, they did. Why do you think John the Baptist said, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to raise up from these stones children to Abraham. But now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, why were... What was the issue of them resting on, we have Abraham to our father? That kept them from having to bear good fruit. And that's why John hit it, okay? It's the same thing. You, because I'm a member of so-and-so church, I got baptized, I prayed the prayer. You go down to these doors in Brookfield and you knock on the door and you want to talk to them about, uh, you know, if you died tonight, do you know you go to heaven and, and try to guide them into the way of salvation? You know what they'll say? Oh, I did that. What do you mean you did that? I went forward in the church. I prayed the prayer. I got baptized. Oh, we're members down here. In other words, I don't have to be, and I like to ask people, are you, would you consider yourself a personal follower of the teachings of Jesus Christ? Oh, well, we go to the church down here. That's not what I ask you. Oh, yeah, I, I got saved 20 years ago. That's not what I ask you. So we're talking about antinomianism. Antinomianism is the concept that faith alone will save without obedience to God's word. And they like to use verses and say, well, the Bible says not by works. It's not by works. But they don't even know what they're saying. They're just, they're just parroting something. It's like all our righteousness are filthy rags. Do you even know where that's at? Do you even know what it means? Or they'll say, Bible says, judge not. Okay, tell me what that means and where it's at and what the context is. Uh, they don't know. They just, they just heard somebody say it. It sounded really good. The Bible, where it says all our righteousnesses are filthy rags, is because the prophet is bemoaning the hypocrisy of his people, the mechanical hypocrisy of his people. And he's saying all of our ceremonial actions, all of our sacrifices, all of our prayers are as filthy rags because it's a bunch of hypocrisy and iniquity. Go read it. Okay. 
So we're saved by grace and not works. What does it mean? Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, if you notice in your notes there, we have a number of possible definitions, definitions that are used in the Bible, okay, of works. When we say works, what do you mean? Do you mean physical movement? Okay, what do you mean by works? Do you mean perfect performance for forensic justification? In other words, I have lived so holy and pure and sinless that when I get to the courtroom of God, the law of God is not going to be able to condemn me. That's forensic justification. Justification by the court. Okay? Are we saved by those works? Anybody have them? No. Nobody can claim that. Except Jesus, right? That's why he could be the Lamb of God. Okay? So, no, works, though that definition is used in the Bible. In fact, it says not of works. It's including that one right there. All right? The next one is ceremonial sacrifices to atone for sin with the blood of bulls and goats. All right. If you were a Jew trusting in those sacrifices, then you would be thinking you were saved by those works. And the Bible refers to that in Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Talking about the ceremonial sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats. OK, so uh, when we say it's a gift of God, not of works, we include that as well. Perfect performance? No, it's not of that. And by, by the way, not of works means the basis for our standing with God. Okay, what's the basis? What, what is the basis of our salvation? Is it perfect performance? No. Is it the blood of bulls and goats and the deeds of the law? No. Is it, number three there, religious practice to merit salvation apart from the atonement of Christ? No. In fact, in Roman Catholicism and in a lot of uh, religions, basically, Jesus put a big down payment with his good works, but that's not going to cover us. So we got to pray the rosary and give to the church and all this, and we add to that pile. And then if we don't get enough in the pile, we go to purgatory. Um, so, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That not of yourselves is talking about saved, not of yourselves, not faith. Okay? The Greek demands, uh, because of the gender of the words, it demands that not of yourselves refers to saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Faith is not the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Right. It's not of works, right. lest any man should boast. Okay? So it's not of perfect performance, it's not of the ceremonial sacrifices, it's not of religious practices to merit salvation apart from the atonement of Christ. What about the next one? Works. Obeying Jesus due to faith in Jesus and accepting Him as Savior and Lord and my High Priest. That is works too. Okay? So, is salvation by grace not of those works? Look, that, that doesn't work. Because those are works of faith. It says, by grace through faith. And obeying Jesus due to faith in Jesus is faith. Mm -hmm. Okay? And faith without that is not faith. So when it says not of works, it means not of perfect performance, not of ceremonial sacrifices, not of religious merit without the atonement of Christ. Not of works does not include faith. Okay? We are saved by grace through faith, not without faith, right. through faith. Faith is obeying Jesus due to faith in Jesus. That's part of, that. those are works, but in this context, he's talking about the fact of us saving ourselves and boasting that we can save ourselves. Faith has to do with coming into God's salvation, coming into the uh, eligibility for the gift. You say, but it's a gift. You can't pay for it. I'm not talking about paying for it. It's a gift, but you have to be eligible for it. Okay? Back to the old gallon of milk illustration. You've heard it many times. Okay? I have some gallons of milk down here. I milk a cow every morning. And if I said, look, everybody 18 years and older, 
You show up there Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, you get a free gallon of milk. So you show up there, you're, you're 20 years old, you show up there at 8 o'clock, and I give you the milk, and I say, that's a free gift. You say, no, -uh. I had to work for it. What do you mean? I had to be over 18, and I had to show up at 8 o'clock. Does that make it not a free gift? No, it's still a free gift. Right. That just made you eligible for it. Right. All right? Faith doesn't pay for it. It makes you eligible for it. Now, that's the difference between earn versus eligible. Romans 16, 25. Listen, listen closely. Paul is signing off on the book of Romans. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known, what's made known? The gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Uh oh, I thought it was not at works. You got to define works properly. Right. Obedience of faith is necessary to have faith. Um, in Galatians 2.16, the Apostle Paul is speaking to Peter. Both of these are law-abiding Jews, fully obeying the law of God as it pertained to them at that time. Uh, which the only difference was they could now fellowship with Gentiles uh, where under the law before Cornelius they couldn't. So they're still obeying every other aspect of God's law. And he says here, Paul to Peter, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. In other words, you're not going to have perfect performance. You're not going to atone for yourself through the blood of bulls and goats. Neither one of those is going to work, okay? You're not going to obey the law perfectly, and you're not going to follow the atonements of the law to save yourself. We, we, we know that now, he says. But by the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus doesn't mean the faith that Jesus exercised. It means the doctrine of Jesus. Right. Okay? The Christian faith. There's the Catholic faith. There's the Muslim faith. This is the faith of Jesus. It means the doctrine of Jesus. It means the narrow road that he told you about. Right. It means following Jesus, all right? So, not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus. Okay, if you are justified by the works of the law, you got to do the works of the law. If you're justified by the faith of Jesus, you got to do the faith of Jesus. Right. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, not because the law is bad, but because the law was never intended to atone for sin. Right. It was a picture of God's priesthood in heaven. God knew that the plumb line, that you, you, you can't live up to it, you wouldn't live up to it because even though you can obey it, okay, perfect performance is not going to happen. You've already, you're already a banished people to begin with, okay? So that's why he created the tabernacle. When you didn't line up with the plumb line, the tabernacle was there for atonement in type. But none of this is going to get you to heaven. Right. That's why Jesus had to come and be the perfect lamb, make the perfect priesthood, and be the perfect priest. Okay, James 2.14. What does it profit, my brother, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? He's talking to the same antinomians. Now, why would he have to say this? Because people in this day were saying, you can't judge me, I have faith. I'm saved by faith. It's like, well, you're not obeying Jesus. It's only by faith. God looks on the heart. It's like, but you've got to obey the Lord you're claiming to have faith in, right? Nope, just, just faith. Faith alone. The Protestants today, following Luther and all those people we talked about, by grace alone, through faith alone. And they don't even mean that. What they mean is through predestination alone. We covered that already. But they'll say these other things. Okay, so faith alone, what does that mean? What does it profit, my brother, unto a man say he hath faith and have not worked? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding. You give them not those things which are needful to the body. What kind of works are we talking about? We're talking about works of love, works of compassion, obeying Jesus, right? We're not talking about works of the law to atone for yourself. We're talking about faith exercised, actually doing what faith requires, doing what Jesus would do, obeying Jesus. That's the works we're talking about. Why? Because you believe in him. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things that are needful to the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not the works of faith, is dead, being alone. Faith alone is dead. 
It's presumption. Okay, it's me saying, oh, I believe in Jesus, he's going to save me, I'm trusting. And the Baptists like, like say, what is faith? Trusting, trusting in the blood. Well, that's, that's convenient because the blood never told you to do anything. I'm just trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's, that's convenient because now you don't have to do anything. Trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross will send you to hell. Christ's work wasn't finished on the cross. Right. The Bible says he rose to be our high priest and he, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship and then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. So if I'm just trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross, which is an antinomian phrase, I hear a lot of people saying that, that they, I know they don't really believe it, they're just saying it because they heard it somewhere. Christ's work wasn't finished on the cross and if it was, we'd all be in hell. He had to rise. He had to take his blood to the mercy seat. He has to be our high priest in heaven or we're all doomed. That's right. So it all has to do with your definition, definition of works. Do you have to obey Jesus for him to be your high priest? Do you have to obey God's moral law to be saved? Does grace mean I don't have to bother with obedience to God? If I do not obey God, will I forfeit my salvation? If I had asked those questions in the Baptist church I was raised in, people would have thought, what do you mean? Salvation is by grace, not works. You prayed the prayer, didn't you? They would have thought that those were just silly questions. I'm, I'm not joking. Well, let's look at Hebrews 5.9. And being made perfect, talking about Jesus, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Mm -hmm. What about those who don't obey him? <laughs> Hebrews 7.22, talking about the mechanics, okay? One thing that really woke me up and, and got me out of all that mess is I was studying the mechanics of salvation. You know, you can, you can talk to someone and they're over there cranking their engine and it won't start. And they say, it won't start. And someone walks up who knows nothing about engines and says, maybe it's the starter. Because it won't start, right? That sounds logical, right? It won't start, must be the starter. No, the starter was working. That's why it was turning over. Mm -hmm. But they don't know the mechanics. Right. You got to know what makes an engine go. So when it's not going, somebody's got to know what to fix. We don't start looking at the starter if it's cranking, right? But, but in, in, in the uh, spiritual realm, there's a lot of people who don't know the mechanics of salvation. Okay, so I pray and ask Jesus in my heart. Now, Jesus lives in my heart. That means I'm saved eternally. Find that in the scripture. What does that mean? Jesus lives in your heart. Well, there's some, there's some truth in that, but it's misapplied and applied without the rest of the spectrum. Okay? There's, there's a little bit of, you got some of the light there, but you're missing a lot of light. The fact is, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him by living a sinless life that he was obligated to do. He didn't live it in your place. He lived it so he could die in your place. His righteousness is not put on your record. It had to be put on his record. So he could then die as a perfect lamb. Mm -hmm. His life was not vicarious. His death was vicarious. Mm -hmm. All right. He died, provided the perfect sacrifice. Then he rose. He went to the tabernacle of heaven within the veil. And now he can intercede as our high priest with the, his own blood, the perfect sacrifice. OK, so how does that work? Hebrews 7, 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. Okay, quickly, so why do I have to obey him? If he's the high priest, he's only going to intercede for those who follow his program. Mm -hmm. All right? By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore? He is able also to save them to the uttermost, all the way to the end. That come, or present participle, keep coming, 
unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Is all this necessary? Does he have to be up there operating as a high priest? Do I have to come and make use of my high priest? Does he have to continue to intercede for me in order to save me all the way to the end? End of what? End of my life? Well, that's totally different than what you'll hear in a Baptist church. Pray that prayer. Your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. Jesus' righteousness put on your record. It's a done deal. 1 John 1, 5 there, which was written to combat Gnostic antinomianism. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, with him and walk in darkness, obviously not obeying God, we lie and do not the truth. That's living in sin. Not obeying his commandments is living in sin. Okay? But if we walk... Okay. Am I walking, yes or no? No. What am I doing? Standing. But salvation's not by works. Do I have to walk? Yes. Yeah, that means you're doing something, right? right? If I'm walking in the light, am I doing darkness or light? Light. light. I'm obeying God. Is that hard to figure out? Um, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and... The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we're saved by works with perfect performance, we lie. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins to who? Our high priest, Jesus. So here we are. There's two big ifs here. If I'm walking in the light, obviously while I'm trying to walk in the light, Sin still happens now and then. I'm not living in sin. That'd be walking in darkness. Mm -hmm. But while I'm walking in the light, there is sin that happens. And I have to confess it. So if I'm walking in the light, if I confess sins that I know, that I did, because if I don't know, I can't confess them. The ones I understand and comprehend and know, if I confess our, our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's saying the exact same thing that Hebrews 7, 22 to 25 said. Our high priest, that Hebrews 5, 9 says we have to obey. All right? That means walking in the light. All the same stuff. Walking in the Spirit, walking in the light, obeying Jesus. It's all the same thing. It's, it's called living in covenant with God. Keeping the terms of the covenant. Um, 1 John 2, 3. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's called walking in the light. Right. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, in covenant with him, that he's our high priest. He that saith he abideth in him ought also himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Jesus said, he walked by every word of God. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin, or basically doesn't keep his commandments, walks in darkness. This is, this, you gotta let the Bible define its terms, okay? Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, the, the nomos. But in this context, we're talking about the law of God, the moral law of God, the holiness of God, okay? For sin is the transgression of the law in A.D. 95. And you know that he was manifested, Jesus was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He manif manifested to save his people from their sins, not just from punishment. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither, neither known him. Obviously, those who know him are walking in the light. They're not walking in darkness. Those who know him are keeping the commandments. They're not, not keeping the commandments. There's two different ways here, okay? And it's obvious, uh, the Bible goes on to say, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Why do we have to say such things? Because of the Gnostic antinomians, that's why. Mm -hmm. The ones who say, well, 
positionally, I'm seated in the heavenlies with Jesus, even though in my performance, I'm not obeying the law of God, I'm not walking in the light, but, but I prayed the prayer, His righteousness is put on my record, God doesn't see me anything but the, the beauty of His Son's record, He doesn't see me in all my sin and wickedness, uh, and so therefore I'm saved. They teach that garbage, I grew up with that garbage, it's hard to believe it, but I bet I, I can tell you this, anybody who has heard that is still affected by it to some degree. You gotta, you gotta work to get that stuff out of your head. You gotta work to realize, you, 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 you want more, more and more, you wanna just kinda rest on God's grace, presume upon His grace, it's not okay. Mm-hmm. There's, I, I hear this kind of stuff in circles that shouldn't be saying it. Circles who know that once saved, always saved is wrong, But you still hear them using the cliches, trusting the finished work of Christ, Jesus' righteousness on our record, things like that. It's like, guys, you shouldn't be saying that. But but they don't understand the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they get caught up in just saying something that sounded really good. Titus 2.11. What do the Gnostics do with grace? And I'm telling you this morning... It's sad. Probably 80 to 90 percent of Christendom has bit into the Gnostic, either antinomianism, Calvinism, Marcionism. That we've talked about the Gnosticism in different realms, and it's hard to find somebody who understands that. People have they're they're raised with what they're raised with. And they assume it's right, and oftentimes their ears are closed. They don't want to hear anything else. It's like, don't confuse me. I think I got it figured out. I don't want to be uh, confused. I don't want to have my foundation shaken. I don't want to be corrected. I think I'm good enough. That's what we meet up with. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. That does what? Bring salvation. Mm Mm-hmm. What grace are we talking about to bring salvation? Hath appeared to all men, teaching us that. What's it telling us? What is grace that brings salvation telling us? Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, what if we don't? Then you're not under the grace of God. You're not in covenant with God. You're not walking in the light. You're not obeying the high priest. Is he ever interceding for you? No. He's not going to intercede to the Holy Father for someone who's not walking in the light. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. He died and shed his blood that he might redeem us from all anomia. We're going to learn about that word a little bit. Iniquity. Every time you find iniquity in the Bible, it's either anomia or a word, uh, I think it's itikia, which is injustice. Usually it's anomia, which means anti-law. We'll look at that in a little bit. Okay, we're not there yet. Um, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's why he died. Now, in Jude 3, you'll see here what the Gnostics do to grace. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend... For the faith, the faith, the doctrine, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, called the faith of Christ, okay? Which was once delivered unto the saints, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, unbridled desire, unbridled lust. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord before God and the word Lord before Jesus Christ means that they're denying His Lordship. They're denying Him the place of being Lord and Governor of their life under the guise of we're saved by grace. You remember what Marcy, I'm not Marcy, and Simon said way back there. That was one of the the first tenets of the Simonians from Simon Magus was you can do whatever you want because salvation is by grace, not works. 
And we're going to see that that's a lot of what Christendom's teaching today. Uh, number one, salvation is a result of entering God's salvation covenant and remaining in covenant with God through Christ's priesthood. These are the mechanics of real salvation. Number two, the purpose of salvation is to reconcile men's hearts and minds and lives to God. Number three, any doctrine that subverts the path and purpose of God's salvation program is of Satan. Satan wants to defeat your reconciliation and salvation. Why? How? Be why? Because he hates you and he hates God. He's trying to hurt God. But how? All he's got to do is muddy the water and confuse the issues so that you say, I know him. John says, are you keeping his commandments? No, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. They thought they knew him. Back in Matthew, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of anomia, iniquity. He goes on to say, Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them is the wise man. Whoever hears these things of mine and doeth them not is the foolish man. What, so what was the problem? They were doing a lot of religious things, but they weren't obeying the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay? The doctrine. Now, uh, Emory Bancroft in Christian Theology, this is a Christian Theology book that was uh, the Baptist give in their Bible colleges. The issue is this. Are we justified perpetually by one act of faith? Or is justification continual as my faith continues? Well, we just answered that because we said if we walk in the light, okay, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us is justification. Walking in the light is our continued faith. If one stops, the other stops. If we stop obeying, he stops interceding. If we stop walking in the light, he stops cleansing us. If we stop confessing, he stops forgiving. All right? But listen to Bancroft. Since the ground of justification is only Christ, to whom we are united by faith, of course, they aren't going to define faith, the justified person has peace. In, 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 their, in our mind, we understand them saying unconditional security is what they really mean. If it were anything in ourselves, like the need for obedience, our peace or our security must needs be proportioned to our holiness, our obedience. But since justification is an instantaneous act of God, complete at the moment of the sinner's first believing, it has no degrees. Justification is instantaneous, complete, and final. And you'll hear them on the radio. It's not D-O, it's D-O-N-E. Oh, it sounds so pious. It's only Jesus. Jesus paid it all. It's nothing in me. Oh, you think you're going to help Jesus save you? Who's going to save you? Jesus is going to save you all by himself. Oh, it sounds so good. It sounds so smart and pious. And it's such a lie and hiss of Satan. Yeah. Remember 1 John? Yeah. How does the priesthood work? Satan would love to get you confused about the priesthood requirements mm -hmm. so that you do not make use of them and you are presumptuous and think that you're, I'm okay, I'm saved, the righteousness of Jesus is on my record. No, it's not. Whoever told you that? The Bible does not teach that. Okay? The Bible teaches that we have a just or righteous standing with God because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And he wouldn't have that to offer if he had not lived a sinless life. But his sinless life, he was obligated to do so he could supply the blood. Okay, Romans 8, 13. For if you live after the flesh, what's going to happen? Ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Can anything be clearer? There are covenant conditions. 
Faith requires you to do this. Okay? If Dr. Jesus says, get on the operating table, you get on the operating table. If Dr. Jesus says, run a uh, half a mile a day, you run a half a mile a day. If Dr. Jesus says, take these pills, you take those pills. And what does that mean? You have faith in your doctor. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you don't. It's that simple. Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also should be cut off. Continue in his goodness. That's walking in the light. That's um, led, of, led of the Spirit of God. That's living after the Spirit of God. That's through the Spirit mortifying the deeds of the body. It's what that is. It's all the same thing. It's all going down the narrow road. It's living in covenant. Hebrews 3.12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, ultimately, if we hold the beginning of our faith, our confidence, steadfast unto the end. End of what? End of your life. So you're not ultimately a partaker of Christ until you have finished your life in faith. You die in faith. It's in Hebrews 11. talking about those who died in faith. You re re resurrected with the righteous. But you're not saved just because you did some little one act of faith business at an altar. It says here, six, uh, Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible, now listen to this because we're going to get... Charles Stanley's comment on it. Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Okay, that's a conversion experience if there ever was one. If that's not a conversion experience, there is no conversion experience. All right? Um... If they shall fall away, and that's not passive in the Greek. Basically, if they shall turn away. It's impossible. What's impossible? To renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh. God only has so much persuasion to bring you to repentance. And when you reject what God has to bring you to repentance, there's nothing else. There's nothing else to bring you to repentance because God's already told you the story how he became flesh, died on the cross, rose again. He's your high priest. He's doing everything he can to save your rotten soul. And if that's not good enough, you're going to go to hell. That's just, that's just all there is to it. So, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth, this is the illustration of what he just said. The earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it. All right. We are the earth. People are the earth. The rain is, is the truth of God, the light of God. And bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed. That's a proper response to God's light. Receive blessing from God. That's salvation. But that which beareth thorns and briars, that which reciprocates to God rebellion and unbelief, is rejected as nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So basically, what are you doing with what you've been given? What are you doing with the truth? What are you doing with the preaching? What are you doing with uh, the Word of God that's given to you? Are you reciprocating to what God wants, what the gardener wants, the herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed? Or are you reciprocating thorns and briars? Now, let's listen to Charles Stanley. This is a condensed version I just got the, basically the crux of what he's saying here all right Charles Stanley talking about Hebrews 6 if one takes seriously the original context of the writer's statements it is clear that this solemn warning in no way threatens the security of the believer by the way Charles Stanley believes in perpetual justification by one act of faith like uh, em Emory Bancroft does okay Actually, it is evidence for the believer's security. If a Jew who was awaiting the coming of the Messiah could find salvation through Christ and then walk away from him without the threat of losing his or her salvation, what do the rest of us have to fear? 
No other group had more revelation concerning the coming of the Messiah. Their whole culture was centered on God's law and his promise about ultimate salvation from sin. For a Jew to come face to face with the claims of Christ and to accept them for a while and then walk away seems unforgivable. But our ways are not his ways, and it's a good thing they aren't. The writer of Hebrews offers a serious warning. It is a dangerous thing for a believer to turn his back on Christ. To do so is to run the risk of drifting beyond the point of return. Not a return to salvation, but a return to fellowship with the Savior. Gag. John 15, 1. The word here we find abide is a little Greek word, "mino." It means to continue. It means to abide. It means to remain. It's translated all three ways. In fact, in 1 John 2, it's translated all three ways in one verse. Continue, abide, and remain. Okay? But what it's talking about is remaining in the light, in covenant, remaining in the grace of God. The, uh, there's a lot of people who want to make this abide in Christ like some super deeper life spiritual experience. No, it's just talking about obeying Jesus, staying in the covenant. All right? The reason they want to make it something else is because they don't want it to be saying that you could lose your salvation. We don't want to think that this is going to affect our salvation. So abide in Christ is some super, the super saint experience. All right? And people like Keith Daniels, guy from South Africa, a very good speaker. Uh, the charity ministries brought him in for a while. But uh, Keith Daniels, I heard him preach on this and just, you know, there again, gag. But he was using that ideology. And when he got down to part of it, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you what he said. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it or cleanseth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean, the same word as purged. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. Remain in me. Continue in me. Same thing. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, if a man continue not in me, if a man remain not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And when Keith Daniels got to that point, he stopped and he said, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I know what it means. You don't want to know what it means. It's a problem. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Continue, same word, minnow. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If not, you're cast forth as a branch and burned. If not, you're taken away. You have to bear fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of a living, obeying faith. Walking in the light. Obeying Jesus. It's all through the scriptures. Now... Here's another one of those guys that believes in perpetual justification by one act of faith, named Curtis Hudson. He was the editor of the Sword of the Lord newspaper after John R. Rice was, and in his book, Salvation Crystal Clear, he gives this illustration of his antinomian gospel. It is one thing to trust Jesus Christ as Savior, and quite another to surrender one's life to the Lord. There is such a thing as a dedicated Christian life, and there are carnal Christians according to 1 Corinthians 3, who have never yielded their lives to Christ. The yielding of one's life or making Jesus Lord of one's life is not a requirement for salvation. That is lordship salvation and a perversion of the gospel. Oh, yeah, yeah, keep yapping your jaws there, Curtis. Um, suppose I'm going to jump from a burning building into a net held by four men. A mechanic is holding one corner of the net, a dentist one corner, an airplane pilot one corner, and an insurance salesman the other corner. I'm going to trust them to catch me. Someone could say, believe on Dr. Demansky, the dentist, and thou shalt be saved. 
But that doesn't mean I have to let him pull all my teeth in order to get saved. It simply means I'm going to have to trust him to catch me in the net. Someone else could say, believe on Mr. Smith, the insurance salesman, and thou shalt be saved, but that doesn't mean I have to buy my insurance from Mr. Smith to be saved. It simply means I must trust him to hold that net for me. When the Bible says in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, it doesn't mean you have to make him Lord of your life. I hope I'm not making you sick. I think I'm making me sick. Philippians 3.18 says they are the enemies of the cross of Christ mm -hmm. whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. How are they the enemies of the cross? The cross was the ultimate transaction for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. They are defeating your reconciliation with God. That makes them enemies of the cross. Right. Matthew 23.15, Jesus said the same thing of the the, the Jews, the scribes and Pharisees, woe unto you for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte or one convert. And when he is make, made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You're making converts for hell. Woe unto you for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves and them that were entering you hindered. Oh my. Talk about a millstone around the neck. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because anomia, iniquity, shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Why? You've made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. And strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. That's what we're talking about. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endure all this false Christendom, false Christianity, false gospels. And this gospel, the gospel that says you have to endure unto the end to be saved, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, let's, let's learn about this word anomia. In the Bible, you have the word for law almost every time. I, I didn't go look it up, but I, I would be, I'd say probably 95 to 99% of the time, this word is going to refer to the Torah. All right? It talks about the law and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets. The whole thing together, we, I've told you, is the Tanakh. But that's just a, uh, basically the initials of the different sections. And they put it together and the Jews made up that term. But Torah is the Hebrew word for law. We call it the Pentateuch. So the word nomos is used for God's law in the New Testament scriptures. Anomia which is almost always translated um, iniquity. Sometimes iniquity is adikia, which is injustice, like I said to you. Um, anomia is awe and nomos. Awe is a negative. It means anti-law or anti-Torah. The word we, we, we get the word antinomian because those are people who have a bad attitude towards God's law, who don't want to obey God's law, who want to be lawless, who want to have grace without the law, grace without obedience, faith alone without obedience, those are antinomians. All right? So, in Matthew's gospel, iniquity is always anomia, law-breaking, anti-Torah. Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the Torah or the prophets, the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. In other words, the obligation, okay, for wherever it's supposed to be applied, till all be fulfilled. God's word is going to continue uh, in, in uh, its appropriate obligations are going to continue. Whosoever therefore, he's explaining what he meant. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so. Teach them that they can break them. He should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And that only, that's just another one of those many proofs that Jesus was not one of those who broke the law and taught men so. Jesus was one of those who kept the law and taught men so. Um, those who break the law and teach men so, he's going to call them workers of anomia. Okay? 
Matthew 7, 12. We're going to skip down through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, 12 is the summation of all that he said. Okay? Therefore, after he gets done with all Matthew chapter 5, 6, and half of 7, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the Torah, nomos, and the prophets. Now, a few verses later in Matthew 7, 21, when he's closing out the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will, doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and then in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of anomia. So the golden rule is the nomos and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets. This is, these guys, though they claimed all this, were workers of anomia, anti-Torah. They didn't obey God's law. They didn't obey God. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, he's the wise man. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, that's the foolish man. Salvation is not just you accepting Jesus, but Jesus accepting you. Right. He's got to say, I know you. He cannot say, I never knew you, or you're in big trouble. He's going to say, I never knew you if you're an antinomian. Right. Number 14, Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, we have the uh, parable of the tares. And why don't you go ahead and turn to Matthew 13. I didn't know if I would do this. I didn't know how our time was going to hold out. Matthew 13, 37, Jesus has given the... Uh, Explanation of the parable of the tares. 1337. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Okay, obviously the Messiah, the Word of God, the Word made flesh, He is, he is by His truth, He's producing a product. All right? He's sowing this in the earth. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Obviously when they, when they sprout up, they sprout up off His doctrine. But the tares are the children of the wicked one who sprout up off his doctrine. Okay? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The devil's the one who preached the doctrine that created the tares. Remember that. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do anomia. What's the characteristic of the tear? He's a product of the devil's false Jesus. He's a product of the devil's false gospel. And that false gospel produces people who think they're going to heaven, who do many wonderful works, it says, but Jesus said they are workers of anomia. That's the tear. They look like the wheat, but the fruit's different because they don't feel any obligation to obey the law of God, to obey the moral ethics of God, to obey the holiness of God. They don't feel obligated to do it. They don't feel pressured to do it. They, they rest on a grace that tells them they don't have to. And they work anomia. The contrast to that, verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth. The righteous, the one God calls righteous. They're not workers of anomia. They work nomos. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them? For this is the nomos and the prophets. Antinomian doctrine tries to defeat all this. Uh, Matthew 13, 41, we went there. Matthew 23, 28. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, Jesus says to the religious leaders, but you're full of hypocrisy and anomia, law-breaking. Matthew 24, 12, And because anomia shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It's not just lawlessness. Okay, it's the terror anomia that would make your love wax cold. 
Because they claim to have the same heaven you do, the same Jesus you do. They say pray. They have their own churches. They have lots of activities. They seem to be doing okay. Surely God wouldn't send them to hell, but they're not obeying God. They're not obeying his word. And if I can go to heaven that way, it's a lot easier. Right? And your love for the truth is going to wax cold because your affection is going to be transferred to a nomo, a nomia, an anomia gospel, antinomianism. 2 Thessalonians 2 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, an apostasy, that's the word. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth or hindereth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of anomia, the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of the, the production of tares, the doctrine of the devil that produces tares. The antinomian gospel that produces tares. The mystery of anomia doth already work. When he wrote 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, in chronological order, is Paul's second epistle. All right? It's early on. For the mystery of anomia doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, or he who now hinders will hinder, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. God's love that, def that def definition of love, okay? Of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The lie of anomia. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Anomia. That's not the word there, but that's what it produces. 1 John 2, 3. We're almost done. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him. And keepeth not his commandments is a liar. We've, we've been through this some, okay? But listen, why does he need to say this? Because there are those who said they knew him and didn't keep his word. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not, beloved. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Why? Because they have the proper hope. If faith is in the proper hope, faith, exercise, does this. It purifies because it understands it has to. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you have faith in Jesus, absolute faith in Jesus, you're going to want to follow and obey him. Whosoever committed sin, that's walking in darkness, remember, transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And... You know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Sinneth has to do with walking in darkness. Not walking in light and tripping and falling and getting back up and walking in light. Okay? That person is, is walking in the light, confessing their sin, and being cleansed. This person is not. 1 John 3, 7. Right after that passage. Little children, let no man deceive you. Why is he having to say this? He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, John R. Rice, when I was, when I was searching this out, I would look in these commentaries. John R. Rice said in 1 John 3, this talking about you know, this says, uh, 
whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, uh, he that is born of God did not commit sin, and so forth. John R. Rice said, uh, this is talking about the born again part inside of you. And this is something that only God sees. And so God knows, you know, whether you, you know, God, salvation starts on the inside and works its way out. And they have all these little, these fancy little things to say. And in my mind, I said, hold it. He said, little children, let no man deceive you. Now, how am I going to avoid being deceived when I can't see what's on the inside? I can only see what's on the outside. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Paul or John is telling them, look, guys, the Gnostics, the Gnostics are saying, God looks on the heart. My heart is pure. You can't judge me. It's by faith alone. You can't expect anything of me. That would be by works. It's by grace. You can't judge me. You can't test me. You can't say that I'm not a Christian. It's in my heart. That was Gnosticism. And John's saying, little children, don't be deceived by that. If they're not doing righteousness, they're not righteous. He that committed sins of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, doesn't practice sin, doesn't live in sin, doesn't live in anomia. They walk in the light. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. All he's saying there is a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. That doesn't mean incapable. It means that's not what they do. If they're still a good tree, they're not bringing forth evil fruit. It's incompatible. Mm -hmm. I'm married. I can't date. Does it mean I'm incapable? No, it's incompatible. Right. All right? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A, a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And he, he says here, he that is born of God doesn't commit sin. Because he's born of God. As long as that seed, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God is abiding in his heart, he's not going to be living in sin. He's going to be walking in the light. In this the children of God are manifest to who? Us. And the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. What beginning? Not as Cain, that beginning. Who was of that wicked one, the same wicked one that we deal with, and slew his brother? That, wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Righteous defined the same way we're defining it here. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. John here is including all the Old Testament definitions of terms. It's the same love, same wicked one, same righteousness, same grace, same everything. The Gnostics, they like to change the definitions. The Gnostics don't want you using Old Testament definitions in the New Testament scriptures. That throws a wrench in things. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But to them, grace is basically God's predestination. Okay? Un unconditional election and choosing and irresistible grace. That's not what Noah had. You got to define your New Testament terms the way God defined them in the Old Testament. God illustrated them for uh, 1,500 years. The record covers 4,000 years. Or at least 3,600. Because they stopped at Malachi. Okay. These things write I unto you, John said, that you sin not. If any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But don't think you can just live in sin. You can't work anomia. You can't walk in darkness. You can't live after the flesh, you'll die. You walk in darkness, there's no blood going to cover you. Jesus' priesthood will not cover you while you walk in darkness, only if we walk in the light. <coughs> If you don't confess your sins to Jesus, you can't expect him to cleanse you and forgive you. There is a priesthood. Your justification depends on you working the priesthood by God's terms. He will save you all the way to the uttermost 
by your continually coming, confessing your sins. This idea that one act of faith justifies you perpetually. Those same people, if you started getting real, backing them into a corner, would fall back on what? Predestination. Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 4, we're chosen in Him before the foundation of the world there. Oh. I confronted a preacher one time. I was, I was right, I was in my early 20s, probably 24, I guess, somewhere in there. And I, I had already, we, my wife and I had already started a Baptist church in Peoria, Illinois. We're, we're building it up. Had some big days of over 300 people, and we had three buses, and we had a building we were paying off. I was, I was going great guns. God began to challenge me about this doctrine. I'd already been bothered by it numerous times while I went to Howells Anderson for a semester. Before that, as a 19-year-old, I wrote a pamphlet, Lord, are there few that be saved? And I was trying to put together the loose ends of Baptist doctrine. I was searching the commentaries and, and the interlinears, and, and it, it was really difficult because these great men with these mega churches and great soul-winning ministries we're saying these things, and I felt like, who am I? So I struggled with it and struggled with it. I, I, didn't, wanna, I didn't want my pride leading me astray. But as a Baptist pastor, pastoring a church, it's now on my back what these people are taught. Their souls are on my back. I'm not just, a, I'm not just an Indian, being a good Indian. I'm now the chief. I better figure this out. Anyways, we, are, we had long talks. We had all kinds. Long story. After the, after the church was disintegrated and we had pulled out of the Baptist denomination, my father-in-law said, hey, we're having some meetings over here. Dennis Carl and Keith Gomez are preaching. You ought to come. I said, yeah, yeah, I know what they're going to say. I know what they believe. Just following their Bible college textbooks. He said, well, they ought to know. Kind of grinding me inside and thought, I don't want to be proud, Lord. I went in and I got before the Lord and I said, Lord, from what I understand, they don't know. But lest my pride be the problem, God, I am promising you, I'm going to get some definite questions together. And after the service, I'm going to confront Dennis Carl with these questions. If he tells me something that I hadn't thought of, if he shines light on something, I thought, okay, that's where the issue is. I'm going to tell everybody I'm wrong. I promise God. I went to that meeting. Afterwards, I went up to Dennis Carl and I said, you know, to talk to him. How are you doing? You know, appreciate your message. It was on prayer. And I said, hey, uh, you believe that people are forgiven uh, when they pray the prayer, they're forgiven past, present, and future, right? Yeah. I said, what about here in 1 John where it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light, you know, he, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. I said, how does that work if we're forgiven past, present, and future? He didn't even want to touch it. He flips his Bible open back to Ecclesiastes to a verse that says, Whatsoever God doeth, it should be forever. And he said, Who saved you? Do you save yourself? God saved you. He's a big guy. Who saved you? I said, God saved me. Here it says, Whatsoever God doeth, it should be forever. And I said, I said, Show me where the context there is salvation. Up, oh, he said, Whatsoever God doeth, it should be forever. And I said, Okay, Lord. I got my answer. Just what I thought. They don't know what they're talking about, and they know it. They can't answer those simple questions, and they know it. Mm -hmm. If your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, why do I got to confess them, and why are they cleansed and forgiven there? I thought they were already done. Yeah, they can't answer those questions. I could have asked him a lot of questions, but he blew it on the first one. I'm telling you this morning, are there few that be saved? That's a scary question. 
If you take all the Christianity out there, all the antinomians, take them out. All the Calvinists, take them out. All the Marcionites, take them out. There's not much left. There's not much left. Now, I'm not saying everybody in those camps is going to hell. What I'm saying is everybody in those camps is in great danger because they have a false gospel, a false concept of Jesus. If they're not in covenant, if they're not walking in the light and, and, and walking in the light to the degree that God will accept, they're going to hell. They're, I was there once and I was following Jesus to the best of my understanding. I had faith in the Jesus of the Bible. My doctrine was wrong, but I was trying my best to obey the Jesus of the Bible. God wouldn't send me to hell in that condition because I was walking in all the light I had. When I began to understand that there were problems, had I shut the door, I don't want to hear it, and stayed in that, I would go to hell. I would no longer have been walking in all the light I had. That's where this, the scare comes in. Let's stand together. Nathan had something he wanted to say. I could see it. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> <laughs> Anyone have a thought to share? Anyone have a thought to share? I hope I've made it very plain. I hope I made it plain on Calvinism, Gnosticism, Judaism. You, get, you, you young people are getting a better than college education just on these issues. You need to keep those notes, study those notes. You need to understand it so you can articulate the truth. And if you have questions... Please ask. There are answers. Do you have a thought to share? Well, I was thinking <laughs> that what you were saying at the end was where the, the first be a willing mind. Right. Uh, it's accepted according to that a man has. But the, that's the, the principle. principle. That's the principle. It's accepted it according to that a man has. Right. Not that he hath not. Yeah. But that willing mind. And, and it doesn't matter if I think you have one. God has to have one. That's what. That's the point that I love to put. It doesn't really matter if you got everybody fooled. God not doesn't agree. <laughs> He's the one that's that. God knows what you hath right. and what you hath not. God knows. God knows that full dimension in those areas. So if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted. That willing mind is walking in the light you have. It is accepted according to what a man hath, and not according to what he hath not. I don't know what I don't know. I can't be held accountable for something I didn't know. But I better be walking in all the light that was on my path. And that's, that's where the challenge comes in. And God, see how, how, how fine is God's pencil, you know? How close is he going to call these things? That's for him to decide. We can look at the parables, search the scripture, and see where God let somebody off, maybe had grace and mercy because God knew, and, and somebody else, boom, no. We need to look at these things and say, okay, what are the principles? Make sure I'm not this guy. I don't want to walk too close to the, I don't want to bank on being that guy. I want to make sure I'm in the middle of the road. I want to make sure I'm, I'm the one where he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, okay? I don't want to be walking along the cliff thinking, oh, I think I'm still in grace. That very attitude will send you to hell. The other thing I was thinking was um, when the Apostle Paul talks about preaching and the words being a savor of life, to some a savor of death to others, mm -hmm. and who's sufficient for these things. It's, it's our job to, to say it just as clear and crystal clear as possible and totally unravel the devil's confusion. But if you don't then act upon that, you... you you may have been walking on like you had, and when we can shed it in a pure way on your path, if you don't act on that, uh, it will be to you damage. It will be increased. It, it will. It can take you if you don't act on it. It can take you away from where you currently stood with God. You might have been fine, and you're not fine anymore. 
because God wants you to go further. So all these different isms have all their doctrines, their theology books, all their churches, their activities. It's keeping you from being in the light as he is in the light. It's keeping you from in that covenant, that priesthood, who will save you to the uttermost. It's keeping you anywhere but there. Anywhere but there. Confusion. Who's the author of confusion? The devil. This is not an overnight thing. He's been working on this since the garden. Okay, half God said, Let, let's make an ism, all right? And your soul, I mean, okay, when I look at this stuff and I look at a book that's not that hard to understand, mm -hmm. and I realize the spiritual forces around it, it makes me more believe it's the Word of God than I did before. It's like, if, they, if there was so much work of confusing physics books, <laughs> where would we be scientifically? If there was so much work confusing computer programming books or any, you know, the, the, the manual for your Ford tractor. There, yet this book, there are universities and churches and major movements and they're doing nothing but confusing the issue. This is a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. And it's, it's, it's worldwide. So what you've been learning this week is incredibly valuable for your soul.